start recording. And I'm gonna turn off my video. Cool. All right. Let's get started. We do have a ton of stuff to cover today. My goal is that we are wrapping up sorts. Uh, so today is the last day that at least from this class, I guess until the midterm, <laughs> that you'll have to worry about sorting, okay? Because uh, I want to get started on a new unit next week. So anyway, welcome everyone. Homework three is due next Wednesday at 11.59. So we're changing the due date from Tuesdays to Wednesdays. The release date of the homework is still the same. So all this means is there's a little bit of overlap between the homeworks. So you will always have something to do. Um, Okay, uh, the homework three walkthrough is available. I posted it on YouTube, I think late yesterday or sometime, I forget there's so much stuff I'm doing that I forget what I'm doing. It does give you a lot of hints. So uh, I really encourage you to look at it only after you have tried the homework on your own, okay? Because you, if you, if you watch the walkthrough, you might be a little bit overconfident as to how much stuff you actually know because it does give you a lot of hints. So I would encourage you to try the homework for a little bit, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes, how much ever time you've got, try each problem in the homework yourself. If you get stuck, ask or work with somebody. And then if both of you are stuck, you've got the walkthrough that you can look at uh, or you can come to student hours and ask questions. Cool. Uh, I also, a lot of the coding and in the assignment itself, uh, it gives you problems. Now, as we've always talked about, there are two questions in our algorithms class that we cover. Uh, is the algorithm correct? And then how fast is it is, okay? For both of us coding problems, there are easy-ish to implement correct algorithms. You are more than welcome to write those. That is a fine solution. I am only looking for correctness. However, I encourage you guys to try to see if you can implement a faster algorithms using some of the techniques we've covered, like divide and conquer, for example, uh, to see if you can come up with a faster version. The way, I would, uh, the way I would do it is I would implement the easy ones first, submit that homework so I know that I have a correct working algorithm and I'm getting my points for the assignment. And then I would probably come back and say like, hey, you know, the professor says I can actually do this in big O log N. So let me try, yeah. 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 So yeah. Uh, so you for for homework one problem, the question is, what if a number appears the most often, but it is not the majority? Uh, you do like your test cases and the problem statement guarantees that you will be given an array where a majority element exists. So even though I do random inputs as the array, they I, I when I generate them, I guarantee that a majority one exists. You guys can maybe try to think of an algorithm how you would do that. It's like generate random arrays, but guarantee that the majority element exists. Um, cool. Uh, but yeah, for that one, you're guaranteed. For the peak one as well, you are guaranteed that there, uh, there will never be more than one peak. Okay. Um, yeah. Cool. All right. So let's jump into class. So today we are going to finish our analysis of quick sort. We are going to cover some non-comparison based sorts and that's it for sorts, hopefully. So that's the entire content for today. It's going to be a little tight, uh, but definitely like feel free to stop me and ask questions. We can always try to cover more of it on Monday. So again, this is quick sort. This is the pseudocode we came up with uh, at the end of last lecture. So this is just a refresher for you guys. Again, it's a divide and conquer algorithm. It takes a random pivot. It sorts the left and the right sides after you've partitioned your array into two pieces. And then it puts the two sides together plus the pivot, right? There is a code implementation here on the replit. You are more than welcome to take a look at that. I encourage you to take a look at that if you have the time. Uh, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna prove that the expected running time of quicksort is n log n, okay? So we're doing an analysis for quicksort today. 
uh, here's the proof. Uh, again, I know a lot of you don't have a statistics background. I actually wish people would teach statistics instead of calculus, because I think in life, statistics is more important than calculus. But uh, yeah, question? Junior, okay, okay, yeah. I mean, you guys should definitely, like statistics, like I would say statistics is actually even more important than like the stuff I'm teaching you. That's, that's all I gotta say. Um, but yeah, but anyway, we're gonna cover a little bit. So the first, this is my proof, okay? So the expected size of the left side of the partition, the, the left side, and the expected size of the right side, my claim is that the expected size of each side is n minus one divided by two. So in expectation, I split the array in half. That's what I'm saying, okay? Um, now, do I need to cover why the expected side of one side is L minus one divided by two? No, oh, okay. Well, I will leave the slide up here. Uh, it has the entire argument. It basically has to do with symmetry and linearity of expectation. Uh, but just believe me that the left and the right side in expectation gets split in half. If I pick an element at random, the array gets split in half in expectation. So obviously not every time, but in expectation, if I take the average, it gets split in half. So then what I do is if that occurs, so if I'm splitting the array in half every time, then my running time is gonna be n log n because it's basically merge sort, where I call myself twice on arrays that are about half the size. Okay, so that's my argument because my recurrence relationship is basically a slightly modified tweaked version of merge sort. So disclaimer, you probably shouldn't have written any of this down because this proof is wrong. Okay. Why is this proof wrong? Why is the, so this, this claims that the expected running time of quick sort is n log n. Yeah. Uh, so it is, it's actually, it is proving the right thing. It is just proving it in a way that's not right. <laughs> yeah, so he's saying, well, maybe it has something to do with the n minus one and the recurrence that actually does not impact it. Uh, you can imagine replacing you can upper bound this by n over two. And again, you're trying to upper bound. So the, the minus one does not matter. Yeah. Uh, because this is plus O of n. Yeah, so that's what makes it n log n. If this was O of one, this would just be log n. Um, this, is, this is right. So it does take n time to put the, to partition the arrays alone takes n time, right? Uh, similar for merge sort. So you don't necessarily need to know this. It's a, uh, but here's, here's one way that you know the proof is wrong, okay? I can use the same proof to prove that a wrong algorithm is just as fast as quick sort. So how are we gonna do that? I'm gonna call this slow sort. And the one thing I'm gonna change is instead of picking a random element, Okay, instead of picking uniformly at random, I will, with probability one half, pick the maximum element, and with probability one half, pick the minimum element. Okay, so why is this algorithm slow? Yeah, uh, yeah, back there, or yeah, yeah, you, uh, you know, you go, you go. the size of my arrays are only gonna decrease by one each time, which essentially means this is gonna be O of N squared. And like, I, I, I might get lucky and like I, I like the, actually you'll never get lucky because you call yourself on both sides of the array. So you'll always call yourself on like basically an empty array and then the pivot. And then you'll call yourself on this array that's the size N minus one and then N minus two and then N minus three. And each time you call yourself, you do N work to put everything back together. So this is actually O of N squared, okay? But the same proof works because the expected size of the left and the right 
is still half. Okay, because 50% of the time, the left side is size zero and 50% of the time it's size N. So in expectation, the size is N over two. And the same argument applies for the right side. So even though the algorithm is slower, we can use the same proof to show that it's N log N. So that's why, the, so this proof is wrong in showing the expected running time of an algorithm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit confusing because. Yeah, yeah, so this, this part is actually fine. This is fine. The part that's wrong, so the reason this proof is wrong, actually we're gonna cover it right now, so maybe that will help a little bit, is that the running time in the expected situation, so this is covering like, I expect the arrays to be split in half. The running time in the expected situation is not the same as the, as the expected running time. Okay, so this comes a little bit from statistics, but it's basically the expected value of a variable. If you take the expected value first and then you square it, is not the same as squaring the variable and then taking the expected value. So expectation does not, you have, like what we want is we want the expected running time. We do not want the running time in the expected situation. So, yeah. Do I take like the optimal situation? It's, yeah, sort of, sort of, but it's covering the expected one. So it's saying here, it's saying like, um, my input in expectation gets split in half. And then it's saying like, well, what's the running time when I get it split in half, right? But that is not what we're trying to get. We're trying to get what is the expected running time of the algorithm on any input. Okay, so we actually have to think about it a little bit more. Uh, we have to think a little bit harder about how the algorithm works to actually get the right answer. The right answer is n log n, but the proof, if you ever see that proof, uh, it's wrong. And the reason it's wrong is because it's taking the running time of the expected input, not the expected running time. Okay, so it's a little tricky. I encourage you guys to maybe look at the slides afterwards and think about it as to why they're not the same thing. But the part you do want to follow is this part. So this is gonna be the correct proof. So you'll probably wanna take notes here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at how quicksort works. So again, if you don't know, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to answer in expectation, how many steps does quicksort take, okay? So because it makes random choices, we can't say it takes n log n steps. Sometimes it takes n squared, sometimes it takes n, sometimes it takes whatever, Something in between those, uh, never, it's never outside of those bounds, right? So uh, what you can do is you can walk through an example. So here's an example of us trying to sort this array. First, what we do is we pick a pivot, okay? Then we partition the array into two parts. So all of this, sh this should be the part that you guys are just following along, this makes sense to you. I'm just drawing it out so we can talk about it. So you partition everything less than five into the left side, everything bigger than five into the right side, okay? The five, I picked it at random, we're gonna say, okay? Then what we do is we call ourselves on the left side, right? So let's say we pick three as the pivot, just randomly, okay? And then we recurse on the right side. So in this case, let's say we pick six as the pivot. We bring five down with us and then we partition the right side, right? So we basically repeat the same thing. We get one, two, three, four, and we partition the, uh, sorry, the right side. We partition to the left side just now. We bring five down with us. Then we recurse on this left side. Let's say we pick two as the pivot. We recurse on this right side, but it's of size one, so we're done, right? We hit the base case where we're at size one. We bring down the three. We partition, so on this side, the left side is empty. So again, we hit a base case where we do nothing. The right side is of size one. So again, we hit a base case where we're done, right? And then uh, we partition around the two. We bring everything else down, right? We've already finished computing them. And 
Finally, we recurse on the one, which hits the base case and it's empty. And this is what your array looks like at the end. Okay. So this is just a uh, specific example of how quick sort works. So hopefully this also helps convince you that quick sort is sorting your array. Yeah, question? Yes, it calls itself recursively. So it picks one pivot, splits it into the left and the right. Then it calls itself on this. So it pretends this doesn't exist and it just calls itself again. Picks a pivot, three in this case, splits into left and right, okay? And, and this is actually what's going on if you like draw out the entire recursion, okay? But the reason we are interested in this is because we wanna answer how long does it take to run? So how many steps that the algorithm take? So sometimes in order to understand the big O running time of an algorithm, it does not actually matter the code or the for loops that you wrote. What matters is what is the algorithm doing? So you wanna to try to understand what the algorithm is doing. So one thing that we're gonna do here is we're actually gonna count the number of comparisons that the algorithm does, okay? It is not obvious why this should upper bound our running time. So you can take it for granted that it does. This gives us a good idea of the running time. It's not immediately obvious why you should do this, why counting the number of comparisons will equal the running time of the algorithm. But intuitively, you can think that for each comparison that you do, so when you're comparing the pivot to a value because you're partitioning, for each comparison, the amount of work that gets done is constant for each comparison. So if you can count the number of comparisons, then the total running time of the algorithm will be some constant multiple of that comparisons, okay? Um, so the question we wanna answer is how many times are any two items in our array compared? Because if we can count how many times they're compared, then we can count how long the array, how long the algorithm took to run. Okay. Any ideas on how many times any of the two items are compared? So for two items, does that mean like two elements? Yeah, any two elements. So when we run quick sort. Let's say I look at any two elements in the array, let's say like one and five, how, many, how would we count? How many times are one and five compared? Okay, so I see one, somebody says one, one time. So in the entire algorithm, the whole algorithm runs and I take my array has a one and a five in it. And I wanna ask the question, how many times do I compare one and five? Uh, let's say there's other elements in the array. These are just some two random elements in the array. I think this could be one because you only compare them to the pivot. Ah, okay. I hear something here. Somebody says, I really only ever compare to the pivot. Okay. So in fact, if you notice, these numbers never get compared to these. That's one thing to notice, that there are pairs of numbers that never get compared. So the four and the seven were never compared to each other. Why? Because when we picked the five as the pivot, they ended up on different sides of the partition. So then they never get compared. So one answer to the question is, there are some pairs of numbers that never get compared. When does that happen? When they end up on opposite sides of the pivot. And then what you were saying is there are other numbers that do get compared, but those numbers get compared only if one of them is the pivot because we only ever compare four and five here actually when we select five as the pivot that's the only time that four and five ever get compared for the rest of the algorithm you never compare them again right because once i split on this side i actually never care about the five it just comes down with me right okay so that is the intuition. You either compare at zero or one time. Okay, uh, that's exactly what we, that what you guys, uh, both of you, told me. Uh, so, like I said in the example with five, everything was compared to three. Not everything. So in this example, we picked five at the beginning. So everything was compared to five, and never again, just once, never again were they compared to five. Okay, but here this three 
only one, two, and four were compared to three. These numbers, the six and seven, were never compared to three because they were on the other side, like, you know, of the pivot. Okay. So the answer is each pair of items in the entire running time of the algorithm either gets compared zero times or one time. Okay. And it depends on your pivots. So it's random. Whether they get compared or not, it's random. Okay. Because depending on which pivot you pick, some items get compared sometimes, sometimes not. So that's what we're going to use here. So to simplify things a bit, I am going to assume that the elements in my array are one to n. This does not matter. Um, it's an exercise to the reader as to why it doesn't matter that I assume my elements are one through n. Um, so what we do is we're going to define, because it's random, whether they get compared or not, we're going to define a bunch of variables. Okay, Random variables, we're going to call them x, a comma b. And they're going to be either 1 or 0, depending on whether a and b were compared or not. Okay, So again, this is using a little bit of statistics. So if you're uncomfortable with this, it's sort of OK, because you haven't covered statistics. But if you are getting comfortable with this, then you're doing great because this is hard. <laughs> okay. Uh, in the previous example, for example, we said that one and five were compared once. So we would have x of one, five equal to one because one and five were compared. So the x's are all going to be either zero or one, but they're going to be random variables, right? That's the whole thing because we don't actually know if one and five gets com get compared or not, it kind of depends on the pivots, on how we pick the pivots, right? But now that we've defined this, right? So another example is x three, six is zero because three and six were not compared in that example, okay? Uh, I'm gonna skip this slide, but it should explain why you can assume they're all one through n. But let's start counting the number of comparisons. So how do we do that? The number of comparisons total during the algorithm is this. If I knew my x's, like if I had the answer to all of my x's, then I can just add them all up. And that will tell me how many comparisons I did, right? Because if I didn't compare them, the x is 0. And if I did compare them, the x is 1, right? So all this is saying is add them all up. The, this is two summations where it's like, Start with x, 0, 1, and then add x, 0, 2, x, 0, 3, x, 0, 4, right? And then add x, 1, 0. Well, it actually skips x, 1, 0 because we already we don't want to double count, but it says add x, 1, 2, x, 1, 3, x, 1, 4. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering why um, the top one, because I can tell, like, um, for a, when a is 1, it's, it's n minus 1. So b is a plus 1, like, and sometimes. Uh, why? Oh, because um, it it only so the very last one. What do you, you don't you you can't have like x n like what does it get compared to? It would get compared to like n plus one, but that doesn't exist. So that's why like you don't have to worry too much about the specific notation. But that's why this is n minus one, and then this one starts at like the next one, mainly so that I, I'm not double counting, right? So like because the x is the way I defined them, like x one zero and zero one are like the same. So if I counted both of them, then I would like be double counting. Technically, it doesn't affect the big O running time, so you could double count if you wanted to. Uh, but in this case, we're avoiding the double counting based on how we're doing the indices. But great question. Good point. So now, so this is, so, so we're saying these are the number of comparisons. If I knew the excess, these are the number of comparisons, OK? It's very easy now to calculate the expected number of comparisons because x is random. So all you do is you put this funny x in front of your function. This is called taking the expected value of a random variable. Now, there's a rule in statistics that says expectation can be moved inside of summation. It's called linearity of expectation. So if you're ever saying, what is the expected value of a plus b? That is the same as the expected value of a plus the expected value of b. So again, you might not necessarily know this. Just take it for granted. This is a rule that is OK to do in statistics. Using that rule, we can bring the summation out, and we can bring the expectation inside. So now we're looking at just the expected value of one variable, a, b. 
arbitrary variable, one arbitrary variable. Okay. How does that, how are you guys following along so far? A little bit. I know, I know this is a little because it's using probably like if you never took statistics, you don't know this rule. It's basically like the distributive rule in math, which tells you like, oh, you can distribute stuff, right? This is just the statistics rule. It's called the linearity of expectation, which says you can distribute the expectation over sums, okay? So at the end of the day, this is what we need to calculate. So now we keep going, right? So we don't know how to calculate it yet, but we do step-by-step, step, right? So all we need to do is we just need to figure out what is the expected value of this random variable, AB. Okay. So again, you might not know this if you don't know statistics, but I will tell you the expected value of any random variable is equal to the probability that that random variable takes that value times the value it takes. Okay. So this should make sense intuitively where it's like, if I have, if half of the time it comes up as one and half of the time it comes up at zero, then the expected value is one half is the probability that it comes up as one. So one half times one plus one half times zero, okay? So the expected value is one half. So again, this is probably something new to you guys, but it is a rule that you, Want to know? Yeah. Uh, sort of, but I'm I'm giving an example of where when you're taking the expected value of a random variable, by definition, the expected value is equal to because the the variable is random. It basically says what you do is list out all the possible values that you could take on. So if you're trying to take the expected value of rolling a die, for example, the answer is three point five. And the reason it's 3.5 is because one sixth of the time it's one. So you do one sixth times one plus one sixth of the time it's two. And then, and then so on. If you actually add all that up, it's 3.5 3 is the expected value of rolling die, which all it's answering is if I were to roll a die a bunch of times and take the average of the results, I would get 3.5. That is what expected value answers is if I were to do this a bunch of times, what is the average? So that. That's why you do like probability times the actual value plus probability times the actual value, okay? So in our case, it's actually really easy because our variable is either one or zero. So this probability kind of disappears because you multiply by zero. So the only probability we care about is this. So we actually get a very easy answer, which is the expected value of this variable is just equal to the probability that the variable is one, okay? So again, I'm in, I am introducing a lot of new concepts. So this should feel like you're struggling unless you have taken statistics before. If you're not feeling like you're struggling, uh, you're doing great. You should take more statistics. <laughs> like if you're following along, that's great. Okay. So all we need to do then is in order to finish up our counting the number of comparisons and expectation now, all we need to do is we need to figure out what is the probability that I compare A and B. That they are ever compared. So again, this is, what is the probability given that I'm choosing the pivots at random? What is the probability that any two elements, let's say six and two are ever compared? I, have, I don't tell you what the pivot is. I'm actually gonna pick it at random. So what's the probability they get compared? Uh, yeah. Two over n, very, very close, very close. Is it one over n? Close, also still very, very close. You guys have the right idea. You're just like off by a little bit. One over n minus one, again, very, very close. I would actually, yeah, I think you guys would get it if you had a chance to sit down and think through it because you're you have the right idea. So if we can, so for example, if we ask, what's the probability that six and two get compared, okay? This happens only if two or six, one of them has to be picked to be the pivot first, right? Two or six is first to be a pivot out of these entries. 
why? Somebody tell me why. So what I'm saying is that the probability they get compared, first of all, one of them has to be the pivot. We, we talked about that. If, if, if one of them is not the pivot, then they won't get compared. So one of them has to be picked to be the pivot, right? Now, why is it that these entries don't count? Huh? Because of the like, maximum and minimum. Right, because these are the entries that uh, if I pick three, five, or two as the pivots, uh, sorry, three, five, or four as the pivots, the array will get split. And then six and four will never be compared, right? So I need to make sure, so from this, if I pick one and seven, you can still compare four and six later because they actually end up on the same side, all right? Yeah. Um, so we are considering the case where it's like what we're asking is that they they ever get compared. So it's the entire algorithm. So we we are not saying what is the probability they are compared right now. So what is the probability that we ever compare them? And what we know is that if I pick seven or one, they can still be compared. So we actually are not going to worry about that case because they end up on the same side. So then it just becomes like. What's the probability that they're compared in this smaller array? So it's kind of like, it doesn't do anything. If I happen to pick seven and one, it doesn't change my probability because I will be asking the same question in my like recursive call on, you know, if I pick one, then all of them end up on the right side. So I'll just be like, oh, what's the probability that they get picked here, right? If I pick seven, they all end up on the left side. So again, I'll, I'll have an array and I'll be, well, what's the probability that one, that two and six get compared? Okay, so the actual probability is just what needs to happen. What I know for sure is if I pick, if right now I pick three, five, or four, I know for sure they'll never be compared. If I pick either six or two, they will be compared. So the probability is just two out of these values. Um, so again, like we were saying, if I were to pick five, then two and six would be separated and they would never get compared, right? Um, so it is the probability that A or B are picked first out of all the B minus A plus one numbers, okay? So again, this is, like I said, for this specific example, we're assuming that the numbers are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's why the formula works out this way. It, it works out this way, even if you don't assume the numbers are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's two choices out of B minus A plus one, which is basically what you guys were saying. So somebody said two out of N, which I think is actually uh, N minus one plus one. So actually that's right for the original array. Actually, yeah, that's right. Whoever said two over N, you were actually right. Um, and then somebody else, was I think you were trying to get to this formula where it's basically an arbitrary array. Okay, cool. So that's the probability. It's two over B minus A plus one. Okay, so again, this is super, like this is like pretty advanced analysis using random variables of a random algorithm. So if you don't have a statistics background and you're struggling, that's kind of expected. I encourage you to review the lecture because you'll need to like think through some of these things. If you don't have a statistics background and you are not struggling, then uh, I don't know what to tell you. You're just pretty smart, I guess. <laughs> and if you do have a statistics background, you should not be struggling with this. Cool. Uh, so then we put it all together. So we said the expected number of comparisons is equal to the sum of the expected value of the random variable we defined which is equal to the sum of the probability that they're equal, which is then equal to the sum of two over B minus A plus one. Okay, so that's a lot of math. That's what you would write out in your paper when you're proving this. Now, this sum is not hard to do. It's in the lecture notes. The summation is in the lecture notes, so it's not hard to do, okay? but it is tricky to do. Like, I do not expect you guys to know how to solve this sum, but the lecture notes do, do introduce you to some techniques. Um, that's kind of the sad part, because once you're here, 
this actually sums up to 2n times natural log of n. So I am not going to walk through as to why it sums up to that. One way to think about it is that if I fix one of my values, let's say I say a equal to 1. If I set this equal to 1, so I'm just looking at the inside, then this becomes the harmonic series. Or it becomes very close to the harmonic series. And then you can upper bound it by the harmonic series. And then this is at most 2n. OK, so it is not like hard, tricky to do, but you need to, one, know about the harmonic series. And you need to think of the trick of like, oh, what if I fix one of the indices? OK. So we're almost done. We saw that the expected number of comparisons is n log n. And is that the same as the expected runtime? Yes or no? Yeah, back there? Yes? Yeah? Um, it does not have to do with the linearity of expectations, but the answer is yes. Because for each comparison that the algorithm does, the amount of work, like the amount of other work that gets done, right? So here we just counted the number of comparisons and we said, oh, that is exactly n log n, 2 n log n, which is big O of log n. Now you could say, what if for each comparison, I have a for loop? Then my running time is not going to be n log n, it's going to be n squared log n. But the argument that we make is that for each comparison, we, we don't do too much extra work, right? Because there is a big O n running time in the algorithm, but that comes from each individual comparison, right? When we pivot. Okay. Cool. So that's quick sort. And what did we learn today? This is what you need to know. The proof itself is an exercise to see, you know, if you come up with a random algorithm, you would want to go through a similar proof to prove its running time. A lot of cleverness, a lot of cool stuff. Uh, I really love it. If you like math, you probably really loved it. If you didn't like math, you probably could care less about it. Um, the only things you need to remember is that it is proven that the expected running time of quick sort is n log n. Okay. The worst case running time is n squared. Uh, now we're going to wrap up these sorting algorithms. These are the comparison based sorting algorithms. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip this slide, but it just gives you some context as to where these algorithms get used. So actually, Quicksort is really good. It's random. It actually gets used very frequently in a lot of sorting algorithms. So for example, when you call uh, G++, which is your compiler for C++, anytime it needs to sort stuff, it actually uses Quicksort instead of merge sort. Because I don't know, they like it better. Um, Java, the default sorting algorithm in Java, is actually merge sort. Okay. Um, something that in practice, the recent quick sort is pretty good. Uh, actually, I'll skip this slide, but we can chat about it. You don't need to know anything of the green. You just need to know the, the blue part. That's, yeah. That's a great question. So the pseudocode that we covered is not in place, but there is a way to make it in place. Um, sadly, we don't have time to cover that method. Yeah, but if you implement the pseudocode we have, it's actually really good in general, but most of the time it's a little bit slower than merge sort. If you implement the in place one, that's where it's just like, like the running time is the same. The big O running time is the same, but because you're doing it in place and you're not making extra arrays and you're not making copies, it's just very, very fast in general. Is that with the swapping instead of like, like swapping places with the pivot? Yes, 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 yes. That is exactly the one with swap. So this one is the pseudocode where you would call yourself recursively, you split the array. The in place one is the one where you can imagine like, it's essentially like, how can I reuse my array as like space for me, right? So instead of like creating a new vector where you like put all the elements smaller than five, you essentially put the five at the very end of the vector and then you swap it with all the elements smaller so that it gets to the middle. And then you put, and then you swap it with all the elements larger. So if it's smaller, you move it down. If it's larger, you move it up. It's a bunch of swapping. 
I consider an implementation detail, but that would give you an, it will help, it will let you partition the array using the same array you were given as input instead of creating new ones. And then you just call yourself recursively on like the first half where literally you say like index zero to index n minus two instead of making a copy. And then you call yourself on the second half. That is like a much better implementation of Pixar. Yeah. Maybe I'll ask you to do that on the homework. How's that sound? Great. But that, that is a great, great question. Um, oh, don't. <laughs> Okay, I, I won't ask you to do it on the homework, but that, that is a great question. That is what you want to be thinking about. A lot of the times we cover the algorithms in a very simple way because you're already having to understand what it does. I don't want to, like, there's so many details that we don't have the time to cover that when you actually implement it, this is why you want to practice writing these algorithms. And hopefully the homework gives you that um, because when you actually implement it is when you really, like, think about all the small details that come up, okay? So <laughs> this is an XKCD. Uh, this, uh, I'll, I'll, you guys can look at it later. It's not important. Um, I really like this sort, this, uh, the panic sort, which is like given a list, check if it's sorted. If it is sorted, return it. Otherwise, from n to 10,000, just randomly shuffle the list and keep checking if it's sorted. If it's sorted, return it. <laughs> Otherwise, check if it's sorted and return it. And then check again if it's sorted and return it. And then at the very end, you return one, two, three, four, five, because because you're you're panicking. You don't know how to sort, so you you panic. Anyway, there's uh there are a lot of other sorts that sadly we don't have the time to cover in the class. Um, but one question that should come to mind, we might have to go into Monday a little bit, maybe not, um, is whether we can do better than n log n, because so far all the even quick sort, which in practice is linear a lot of times, the expected running time is n log n, okay? Um, yeah, quick start is expected n log n. And really here, it kind of depends on who you ask, okay? There are two opinions. There are people that, says, that say, yes, we can sort faster than n log n, faster than merge sort, and there are people that say, no, you can't beat n log n. And the reason, is that all the algorithms we've covered so far have relied on the fact that we don't actually care what the numbers are. We just need to know whether one thing is bigger than the other thing, right? So like, they don't have to be arrays of integers. If I give you like arrays of potatoes and then you come to me and you tell me like, is this potato bigger or is this potato bigger? And I tell you, well, it's that one's bigger. You don't even need to know like it's a potato. You don't need to know anything. You just need to know which one's bigger. All of the algorithms we have studied so far are relying on that comparison, okay? It has been proven that any such algorithm that relies only on comparisons must be n log n. There is no faster algorithm. I wish we would have time to cover this proof in class, we're gonna put it on the lecture slides, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, all right, sure. Um, I encourage you, if you are interested in proofs, take a look at this proof in the on the course website. You are not required to know it, it is not part of the course. Um, but this is the first proof I ever encountered where it's actually proving a negative, right? So for most of the times in this class, we will be given a problem, we will then, come up with an algorithm, and then we will prove this algorithm has this running time, okay? This is the first time ever, you, at least you guys have seen so far, where somebody proved that no matter how smart you are, you cannot come up with a better algorithm than merge sort, okay? Um, I give out the main gist, I'm gonna skip most of this, but that's one answer. The answer is no, which is actually good, because that means that merge sort is like optimal. So if somebody ever tells you like, how fast can I sort elements and I can only compare them, you already have the optimal algorithm. You like have the fastest ever. Nobody, uh, nobody is ever gonna come up with a faster algorithm than n log n. Yeah. So great job, you're already the best. Yay, the cat celebrating, okay guys? Now, there are actually ways to sort elements faster than n log n. 
but you have to move beyond algorithms that can only compare elements. Okay. So, uh, here's an example. Let's say I asked you guys to sort by your birth month, right? To sort yourselves by the month you were born in. How long is that going to take? Like how many, how many people, like let's say you guys are, you all stand in line. How many people do I have to swap in order for you guys to get sorted by your month, by the month in which you were born? So like all the people that are January are first, all the people that are February are second. Uh, if you use the comparison based algorithm, it would be N squared. If you're probably thinking of like an assertion sort or something. You could use you could use any of the sorting algorithms we've covered. Yeah. So actually, the uh, okay, whatever. I, I guess I didn't put it in the slide, but you can imagine that what I can do is I can just go up to each person and I can ask you. Were you born in January? Okay, you go first. Then I go to the next person. Were you born in February? And I say, or like, I ask you, what month were you born in? And you tell me I was born in December. And I say, well, you're gonna go, like, I take the room and I put everybody in December goes here. Everybody in November goes here. Everybody in whatever the month before that goes here. And then for each of you, I go up to you and I say, well, when, what month were you born? And then I just take you and I put you into the bucket where you were born. And then once I've put everybody into their buckets, you will be sorted by your months, right? All the January people will be at the front. All the February people will be next. All the March people will be after. Um, that sort takes O of N time. It is linear, right? Now, why can I do a lin like We just said you couldn't do sorts faster than N log N. So why is that sort faster than N log N? You have, you, you, uh, yeah, back there. Yep, yep. Yep, 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 yep. These are all the perfect ideas. You have a fixed amount of months you can choose from. You are not comparing values to each other. So I never ask, you know, were you born before she was born or were you after? I never ask that. I just ask you, what month were you born in, right? So I'm using the fact that the months themselves have been ordering already, and that I can just ask you what month you were born in, I can put you directly to where you were born. So um, that is actually an example. Uh, this slide is a little wonky of something called counting sort. So you can imagine that if you have an array of integers, you can actually sort them in O of n time. How? Yeah. Yeah. So you're right. So counting sort, you need to know a maximum. So what is the maximum possible value that will appear in your array? In this case, it's nine. But let's say we know what the maximum is. Then I can just make a bunch of buckets. And then instead of doing all these comparisons and sorting who's bigger than other, I can just say, well, Nine goes here, six goes here, three goes here, five goes here, two goes here, one goes here, and then two goes here, right? And then I can just say, well, let me go in order of the buckets. I grab one, then I grab the two twos, then I grab three, then I grab five, then I grab six, then I grab nine. And now this array is sorted. And how much time did it take me? Oh, then I only ever looked at each element twice. I looked at it to know which bucket it goes into, and then I looked at it when I was looking at the bucket and putting it over here, right? So uh, next on Monday, we are going to cover an extension of counting sort called radix sort, and that will be the end of sorting, all right? Cool. Uh, then we will start trees and, uh, and graphs. So hopefully you guys are excited about that. All right.
All right, everyone on Zoom, I will stop sharing and see you guys next week. See you then. Yep, bye-bye.